Hello, good morning and welcome to all our participants. I hope everyone is staying safe and doing well. My name is Phoebe Nones and I'm the trade manager at the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce or BMCC as we are known. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's topic is COVID-19 vaccinations, a timely talk to address your concerns and expectations. Our esteemed speaker will be Dr. Noor Ilini Borhan, consultant and emergency physician at Sunway Medical Center. Dr. Ilini, thank you for joining us today. Hi, good morning, Phoebe, and thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Dr. Ilini will address your concerns and issues on COVID vaccinations. Despite the fact that more than 733 million doses of the vaccine have been administered worldwide, vaccine hesitancy remains high among Malaysians. This webinar aims to address and highlight the effects and concerns for those who are uncertain and want to understand more about the after effects. Our expert speaker from Sangway Medical Center is on hand to provide timely insights on today's topic. Dr. Elini has presented several papers in national and international conferences and is also a frequent guest speaker for local TV talk shows. Her professional interests are cardiovascular emergencies and trauma. She's also an instructor in our Malaysian Trauma Life Support and previously the co coordinator for basic life support and advanced cardiac life support for UITN. So a few housekeeping items before we begin. Please be forthcoming with your questions during the session and send them in through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen instead of in the chat box. We will attempt to address your questions during the Q&A session if time permits. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Laney to give a presentation. Dr. Laney, the floor is yours. Okay, hi Phoebe. Thank you for having me this morning. Hi, so thank you BMCC for having me this morning again. As we know, today I'll be talking about one of the current hot topics, globally actually, which is about the COVID-19 vaccination. So before I, you know, we indulge further in it, I'd like to briefly talk about the stages of severity of COVID-19, as many of us are actually unaware of it. So when we actually talk about COVID-19, there are five different categories we're talking. Okay, the first category is when you have the virus, but you're asymptomatic. This means that you do not have any symptoms at all. You're unaware and you tend to be the carrier for it. Category two is when you have mild symptoms, for example, fever, a bit of cough. Some people, they just present with sore throat, runny nose, but they are infected with the virus. So for category one and two, these are the ones that we would advise for home quarantine. But the ones that we talk, you know, when we talk about severe symptoms or severe COVID-19, we're actually talking about category three, four, and five. Category three are those who have pneumonia, but they do not require oxygen. So what happens is when you, have a cat, when you are in a category three, you go to the hospital, they do a chest x-ray on you and they notice pneumonic patches over on your lung chest x-ray. For category four, you need oxygen. Category five are the ones that are admitted in our ICU, intubated on a ventilator and so on. The thing is, 60 to 70% of positive cases are actually category one and two. So most of the time when we tell a patient that they are positive, their response would be, how come? I couldn't be positive. You know, I don't have any symptoms. But do bear in mind, despite being a category one and two, you are still positive and you could still carry the virus to anyone. Problem is, for example, yesterday, we've had about 7,800 positive cases in Malaysia. 59 death, we have emergence of new variants, we have, you know, our ICUs are full, we are sending patients even to other states, this is what I heard from my friends in Sungai Buloh, we have uh, field ICUs by the army hospitals as well, and our main COVID hospital are using containers as makeshift mocks, because of the number of deaths that they, the, our mortuary just could not supply, but the thing is, with this number of cases, we're only getting about 
46% of people registering for the vaccination. So what is the problem right now? Thing is, let me broadly define the population in Malaysia into three different categories. 50% of Malaysians are convinced with the vaccine and will take it because they understand that the benefit far outweighs the risk. And then we have 10% of the recalcitrant anti-vaxxers. But the main thing is 40% of you guys would need to be further convinced and that would be the fancy test. You know, the ones we are targeting with hope that they would opt in for vaccination. In 2020, most people spend you know, their time at home more than ever before, seeking ways to stay connected to other people. Naturally, we turn to social media, where it's cliche to point out the place where misinformation spreads. So what we see this year are normal, very rational individuals deciding that they do not want to receive a safe and effective vaccine for a potentially deadly virus, despite the alarming number of cases and mortality we've had so far. So what were we afraid of? We were afraid that, you know, the vaccines were rushed, they're not safe, you know, getting the vaccine will give me COVID, the mRNA would tweak my DNA, I'll be microchip and monitored, uh, blood clots in AstraZeneca, I, want to, I don't want to be infertile, and the side effects. So all these things are basically myths in which we, are gonna you know, address to your doubts and fears. And what I'm here to do today is to set some of these common concerns out and try to respond to them. Before we proceed any further, I'll just talk briefly about what a vaccine is. A vaccine basically contains antigens that serve to stimulate our body's immune system and form a sort of immunity to that specific infectious disease. Long, long time ago, the Chinese has already recognized that people who had contracted smallpox back then were immune to reinfection. So what they did is they preserved the scabs from individuals who had suffered mild cases, dried them up, crushed them into a powder and blew them up the nostrils. It was not till the 18th century when British physician Edward Jenner developed the first safe and reliable version of vaccination towards smallpox. And then since the early 1950s, Vaccines have been given through our national immunization program to protect our Malaysian citizens. To date, 11 types of vaccines are given to children. And additionally, we even have the meningococcal vaccine, which is compulsory for all Malaysians heading to perform their Hajj and Umrah. So what's the difference between the COVID-19 vaccine? It's basically the same thing. It stimulates our immune system so that you know when we are actually exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, our body will be able to react against it. So these are the supply of vaccines that have been acquired by Malaysia. The supplies have been received in stages since last February, subjecting to our NPRA approval. Well, um, Pfizer was the first vaccine that landed on our shores. It was one of the two vaccines to be first approved by WHO, actually. Uh, it requires two shots and it's an mRNA vaccine, which means it's purely synthetic. mRNA is a molecule that our cells use to produce protein. In this case, the synthetic mRNA holds the code for the spike protein of the novel coronavirus. When the mRNA goes into the cells, our cells will read the code, produce the spike proteins, and then trigger the immune system to make antibodies. Other than, you know, the other two that we know right now are the AstraZeneca and Sinovac vaccine. Uh, besides the three current vaccines, Malaysia's NPRA has yet to approve two more vaccines namely CanSinoBio from China and Sputnik from Russia. In total, Malaysia has procured a total of 66.7 million doses, which are more than enough to cover the targeted population to achieve herd immunity. People have been asking actually, why did we decide on these five vaccines? I mean, there's, you know, we have Moderna, we have Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, I mean, but why this particular five? Well, one has to understand that the vaccination process was started very early on. An expert panel was convened to look at how we could make early purchases of vaccines for Malaysia. So we had to make early bets in order for Malaysia to be near the front of the queue for vaccines. And at that time, some had no clinical data available from any vaccine company in terms of full-fledged information. Only very early stage clinical information was available. So from 
all the many vaccine candidates, they narrowed it down and drilled down further to look at safety effectiveness based on whatever preliminary data that was available then. And eventually they decided on these five that our government has made advanced purchases for with the aim of building a diversified portfolio of vaccines. So far, we will be giving the vaccine for free to all citizens and non-citizens of Malaysia. And as of 26 of May, the total number of vaccinated citizens are as shown in the slide I have. So initially, we plan to have three phases of vaccination. We've completed our phase one successfully. We are currently in our phase two and we'll proceed with our phase three. So phase two started um, back on April 19, where you know the target was to cover senior citizens, people with chronic diseases, and people with disabilities. And you know, they have started to receive their second dose, started about two weeks ago. The thing is, the pace is relatively slow in the beginning at around only 22,000 doses per day, but it's slowly picking up as more vaccine supplies are delivered and more vaccine centers are open. What I heard this week is that we're um, giving about 40,000 doses per day for phase two alone. Thing is, on May 5th, our uh, YB, Kairi Jamaluddin, actually announced that the commencement of phase three has a possibility of being delayed due to low supply of vaccines to our shores. What was said is that the slow pace was due to pharmaceutical companies, which were prioritizing rich countries more and giving them deals which were not offered to developing countries. As you know, due to that fact, Malaysia has also started using the local field and finished by Pharma Niaga with hopes to increase our vaccine supply to the country. So according to our health minister, Dr. Arham Baba, a total of 200, uh, 290,000 Sinovac vaccines will be used at vaccine centers starting next week. So Pharma Niaga claims that they're capable of producing 2 million of Sinovac vaccines per month, which is a good deal. And similar to Pfizer, Sinovac is a two-dose vaccine from China, and Malaysia has adopted a 21-day interval between the first and the second dose. thing is, people are going to ask, can I choose which vaccine to take? Well, currently, no, according to our JKJAV, which is the uh, basically the unit that keeps the assessed vaccines in our country. So the, in terms of choice of vaccine, the problem remains the fact that we have a far greater demand than supply. We are not in a position in where we are able to buy 20 million doses of each type of vaccine and offer a small amount of choices to people around us. If that's the case, well, then everyone will be able to choose what they want. But logistically and economically, it's just impossible. And the idea right now is to vaccinate as many people as possible so that we can get a whole lot protected and achieve our herd immunity. However, our YB Kari Jamaluddin also has mentioned yesterday in a press conference that they are looking at allowing the public to choose the vaccine they want, as well as the venue and date to get it. But for now, we are still subjected to the choice of vaccine depending on the stock availability at the vaccination center. Unless some of us had chose the opt-in for AstraZeneca vaccine. So what happened in early May was that the AstraZeneca vaccine was carved out from the mainstream program to have an opt-in parallel track. These are basically for those who do not want to wait much longer for their turn in the mainstream vaccine queue, uh, you know, and acting as an alternative, providing an avenue to get vaccinated much sooner. So what happened 20, on the 2nd of May? They opened for those in the Klang Valley and it has cost, you know, we had more than 200,000 registered within just three hours. They were quite happy with it. They opened a second round where the second round was for 1 million doses of AstraZeneca was made available on the 23rd for those above 60 and another 300,000 for those below 60 last Wednesday. Apparently all slots were taken up in you know only about one hour. And this shows that the people were very happy with it. So yes, of yesterday, news came about that the AstraZeneca will no longer be in the opt-in options. And now back in the part of the immunization program. So because according to them, this was due to the fact that you know, there was no longer any hesitancy by the public and AstraZeneca has been well accepted by our citizens. Hence, a decision was made that AstraZeneca will be back in the program. 
a lot of things has been happening actually. <laughs> but for example, if you do not want to take this, news has also mentioned that 2 million Pfizer doses are going to be expected in July. And it will be the biggest supply of vaccines anyways. So whether you'll be getting AstraZeneca or Pfizer or Sinovac, these three main vaccines will be supplied across all our vaccination centers. And we'll see how it goes from then on. Then again, is the vaccination compulsory? No, it is purely voluntary. However, you one needs to know the responsibility and how important it is for our community to achieve herd immunity through vaccination. Because it has been proven very well in so many data worldwide to protect us from severe COVID-19, especially when it comes to the vulnerable populations. If you actually look at the data of those who passed away the past week, everyone has been dosed in the elderly population. So what is this whole thing about herd immunity? Well, herd immunity basically means when enough people have developed immunity to a particular infectious disease, making the risk of transmission in a community significantly reduced or ultimately eliminated, for example, like smallpox. The herd immunity, well, there's a calculation to it. So that's why we project about 70 to 80% of Malaysians that needs to be vaccinated if we want to achieve this. Hopefully, if we can get that amount of people vaccinated by end of the year, 80% I'm aiming, we'll have enough people protected. Hence, we're looking at less COVID cases in the country. This has been shown by a significant reduction in number of cases, number of hospitalizations, and in, you know, in other advanced countries who has their vaccine program started way early on. I mean, we recently saw like in Turkey, for example, they use mostly Sinovac and they show that their hospitalization for above 60 has reduced by half. Bloomberg and a lot of other data has actually, you know, they look through our vaccination process and they look at the registration and how slow it's going. So they estimated that we are only going to achieve our herd immunity in 4.9 years. So the date will be 10 of June, 2025. We do not want this to happen. And another thing is, despite me saying that it was purely voluntary, if we don't see more sign-ups, um, there's going to be a critical point where Malaysia would need to have the extra push, where we need to make it mandatory with the reflection point being this September. The reason September was used as the target because by September, we should have enough vaccines arriving in Malaysia to cover 80% of the population. So by then, our supply would have exceeded our demand. And we need to look at in September is how many people have registered, how many people have taken the vaccine, and what are the number of cases like? Has it gone down? Is it still raging? So there's a lot of considerations to think in September. In our cases, I mean, if our cases are still high and the registration numbers are still low, then some tough choices has to be made. So, you know, and a lot of people actually ask me, you know, since there are so many COVID cases already going on, why can't we just rely on natural immunity for it? Okay, bear this in mind. A person can develop natural immunity from only two ways. One, from being infected with the virus or from getting a vaccine. It comes when your body actually remembers an infection. And with this memory, your body will learn how to fight it off if we ever get infected again. The strength of immune response and the length of time the protection lasts is very different depending, you know, uh, in between vaccine immunity and natural immunity for COVID. Studies have actually shown that up to 5% of people who recovered from COVID-19 actually lose their immune protection after an average of six months, making them successful to reinfection. So there's been cases where some had reinfection as early as one month leading to hospitalization and mortality. So this is not actually good news. So what the COVID-19 vaccine actually offers is a safer and more reliable immunity in comparison to natural infection. They also generate a much stronger and more consistent immunity. Studies looking at Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccine actually shows that antibody levels are, were much higher in vaccinated people than those who had recovered from COVID-19. Then again, why are we not giving it to those below 18? Um, well, this is mainly because the previous clinical trials of the vaccines that we're using were conducted on volunteers age 18 and above. 
But Pfizer in late March actually released preliminary results from a vaccine study of 2,000 US volunteers aged 12 to 15, showing that there were no cases of COVID-19 among fully vaccinated adolescents compared to those given a placebo or dummy shots. For kids, they had, this, they had side effects as well, but it was similar to us adults, mainly pain, fever, chills, fatigue, particularly after the second dose. But the study will continue to track participants for two years or more for further information about long-term safety. As of now, the US FDA expanded the emergency use authorization of Pfizer vaccine to children aged 12 to 15. The decision was made linked to a phase three trial that proved the vaccine is both safe and effective in that age group. With regards to younger age group, trial results showing how well Pfizer COVID vaccine works in kids as young as two years could be ready by this September. So let's wait and see and pray for the best for our children. Some actually were quite worried because they said, you know, the pandemic has only been going on for about a year and a half and yet, you know, the vaccines are already out. Uh, is it still safe? Well, okay, the reason the companies were able to shorten the process twofold is because number one, we were in a pandemic. Okay, there were no shortage of volunteers wanting to come forward, especially in countries like in the UK and the US where the virus was raging at one point. All they want is a vaccine to be given to them right then and now. It, it's not like, you know, when we had to do our TB clinical trials, it took us five years just to collect enough volunteers for it. And number two, they have been able to get these trials going on a concurrent basis, not trimming back, not compromising, but in a parallel and therefore shortening the time so that the, the entire process of validation, testing, clinical trials, looking at the data has not been compromised a single bit. So if you ask me, despite it is not fast track, everything was done safely. They did not compromise on anything. And everything was thanks to the economy at that point and also the number of volunteers that helped out. So efficacy of COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, um, people tend to wonder, okay, Pfizer tells you that they have 95%. AstraZeneca initially 65%, and then we had Sinovac at only 50.4. What's with the numbers? Obviously, everyone wants Pfizer. Do understand that these are just efficacy numbers. In other words, how much less likely you will get sick from the virus if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. The thing about these numbers is that they are constantly changing. For example, the AstraZeneca vaccine was found to be 76% effective in the US trials, as those numbers are when the shots are given one month apart. But when you actually spread it out three months, it's 82% effective. Study shows that a 12-week interval between the first and the second dose is 82.4% effective if it's given at 12 weeks apart in comparison to 54.9 at a six-week interval. It was also actually found that a single dose of AstraZeneca vaccine was 76% effective at three to 12 weeks after the shot was administered. So now you're gonna think, uh, surely 95 is gotta be better than 82%, right? Actually, no one knows. And that's because these studies were done at different times in different parts of the world with different group of volunteers. Vaccines are less effective against the newer concern strains that they are now. The Pfizer and Moderna trials were done when we didn't have those variants, whereas the AstraZeneca trials were done more recently when the variants have already begun to circulate. Also, these are the numbers of Pfizer vaccines when you get your shot three weeks apart at 21 days. What we do not know is how well the vaccine is when you get your shot three to four months apart like the AstraZeneca vaccine. So although 95% sounds better than 82%, it's like saying a guy who scored 95% for his SPM mathematics is way smarter than a girl who scored 82 for her astrophysics exam. The questions are just so different, you can't know. But what I'm gonna tell you this, those numbers are not even the ones we care about. These numbers, Pfizer at 100, Sinovac at 100, and AstraZeneca at 100%, these are how effective these vaccines are to protect you against severe COVID-19, like basically a category three to a category five. 
things like ending up in the hospital or dying from the virus. So at the end of the day, all these vaccines protect us really well. This is what I got from the Public Health of England surveillance report. I'm going to close the second dose here. What I'm going to prove to you is this. With just one dose, you can see that the hospitalization and mortality were significantly reduced. You only get what 85%, 80%. And for AstraZeneca, 85 and 80% as well. So this is how well the vaccines are effective even after a single dose. So is it safe for usage in Malaysia? Definitely, they've went through everything. What I would say is we should trust our regulatory body. The NPRA is one of the toughest regulatory body in the world. They scrutinize every single data that they have to make sure that whatever they approve is safe and efficacious in Malaysia. Then what about the AstraZeneca? Everyone is so worried about it. Well, the AstraZeneca vaccine requires two shots. It uses a viral vector. In other words, instead of using mRNA to get our bodies to make the spike protein, they use a virus called adenovirus. That modified adenovirus is harmless to us, but is designed to contain the same coronavirus spike protein. So when our immune system is exposed to the protein, it creates antibodies to protect us from COVID-19. Now, the big question is on everyone's mind, are they safe? More than 600 million doses of these vaccines have been administered around the world. As expected, about 1 in 10,000 have gotten severe allergies to the shots. And those are mostly people with strong history of allergies or anaphylaxis. But good news to that, if there are other side effects, they are extremely rare. What about the unusual blood clots? Everything is always about blood clots. Well, they are so rare that even if they are from the vaccine, your chances of dying from COVID-19 in this country will be at least 50 times higher than your chances of getting one of those blood clots from the vaccine. Your chances of getting it from smoking is a lot higher too. So as you can see, with AstraZeneca vaccine alone, UK has gone from 1,000 deaths per day to only three. So what's holding us back anymore? It is already proven that the vaccine is 99.9% .9 safe and prevents death or severe COVID. Who should not take the vaccine? It's simple. Those with history of severe allergies or anaphylaxis after receiving the first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. For example, I took a Pfizer vaccine. I got anaphylaxis from it, which is swelling of the face, the mouth, difficulty in breathing, anything that requires hospitalizations. I cannot take the second dose of it. Or I could probably change the brand. Or if I have any history of severe allergies of anaphylaxis to other vaccines, medications, or other substances that you are not aware of. So vaccine-associated anaphylaxis is actually rare. The estimated rate is 1.3 million vaccine doses. Um, however, any vaccine can cause anaphylaxis. Any medication can cause anaphylaxis. The risk of reaction is related to the components of the vaccine and the specific vulnerabilities of the individual vaccine recipients. So many so-called reactions to vaccines are not actually allergic in origin. The immediate symptoms of vaccination are most likely caused by vasovagal episodes or anxiety. For example, they feel their heart beating very fast, palpitations. They have, um, they feel giddiness, very lightheaded. They feel they want to black out. This could be vasovagal effects or anxiety. Okay. Most people with history of allergies can receive the vaccine, but they should all be observed for 30 minutes post-vaccination. A lot of them actually ask me how about NSAID allergies. NSAID allergies, they are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, basically painkillers, for example, uh, Voltaren. So they're actually quite common and they are not at greater risk of COVID-19 vaccine nephalaxis. Even those with penicillin or any other antibiotic allergies can be vaccinated as well. So what should I do immediately after receiving the vaccine? This whole place is a controlled environment. Once you are done, they'll put you in an observation area where they will observe you for 15 to 30 minutes. 15 minutes for those with no history of allergies, 30 minutes for those who has. So once you have symptoms of difficulty in breathing, spelling of your face, palpitations or dizziness, just immediately inform the healthcare provider there. Can I take it at the same time with other vaccines? Well, this is not recommended. You need to postpone your COVID-19 vaccines at least two weeks after receiving another vaccine. Or if you're doing it the other way around, take your um, other vaccine a month after your COVID-19 vaccine. 
if you have already recovered from COVID-19, you still do need to take the vaccine as well. Because like I've mentioned earlier, natural immunity that you've gained from COVID-19 could you know, be gone within six months and reinfection could reoccur again. So it's recommended that for either you could take it six months after recovery from COVID-19. How about if I'm a close contact? Well, if you're a close contact, be sure to complete your duration of home quarantine first. Make sure that you're symptom free. And if you actually tested yourself uh, with a PCR, make sure that you're negative and then you can be vaccinated. Okay, number one, you won't, you won't be immune to COVID-19 after the vaccine, okay? COVID-19 vaccine, number one, it is not a drug, it's not a medication, it's a vaccine. Your body needs some time to develop an immune response. You have to wait for the vaccine to work. It takes time, like many other things. You know, and that's the important thing for the public to understand. For example, the Pfizer vaccine specifically, you need to take two doses at 21 days apart. And after the second dose, it takes another one to two weeks for your full immune response to develop. So that means a total of four to six weeks in total after the first dose is given. Now, in between that time, any individual is susceptible to exposure. However, if you are exposed, the vaccines are 100% effective in preventing severe symptoms or hospitalization. So, okay, it helps to look at it, it helps to look at the different outcomes if you're exposed. The best case scenario, if you don't get sick at all, the worst is death, all right? In between, there's hospitalization, severe to moderate symptoms or having no symptoms at all. In the absolute best circumstances, vaccines give you protection all the way to there. But realistically, that isn't the main objective of COVID-19 vaccines. The real purpose is to give your body enough protection to cover these possibilities. So if you do get an infection, it will appear as if you're having a cold rather than something you'll be hospitalized for. Okay, but now we're having so many new variants that a lot of us are actually skeptical if the vaccine can actually protect us against it. Well, recently, um, our Director General of Health announced that Malaysia detected the UK variant, we have the South African variant, and a few days ago, more cases of the Indian variant. For us, it is alarming to know that these variants have arrived in Malaysia. But what is happening right now is that we are closely looking at the data that has been coming out from places where they have been coming these variants. Okay, so far it looks like the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccine um, shows that it still has protection against the UK and South African variant, as well as the Indian variant as well. Although the efficacy might be a bit lower, but the protection against the severe COVID is still there. So these are the high risk population that should be prioritized in our phase two currently. What is not mentioned here will also include a severe mental illness, those with schizophrenia, bipolar, or any mental illness that cause severe functional disabilities because they have difficulty in adhering to our SOPs. This is why we are prioritizing them in our phase two. But is it safe if we actually have multiple medical conditions? I think this is a very important point to be raised, but it's precisely that particular group of individuals who are older with multiple comorbidities that tend to get more ill and tend to have high mortality. And it's specifically this group that we hope will take up and get vaccinated. In the clinical trials they did in Pfizer, quite a number of those individuals were in fact individuals with comorbid medical conditions because this is the target group for the vaccines due to the complications. And as of the many millions of people who were vaccinated now across the world, there's a huge diversity in terms of age, comorbid medical conditions. So there's a wealth of data showing that the vaccine is safe. This also includes to cancer patients who has low immunity. People were asking me a lot of times, how about those on blood thinners? Um, most patients do not need to interrupt their blood thinners before getting the vaccine. The COVID-19 vaccine is given a shot at, a, at our deltoid muscle, just like the normal flu shot. The needle diameter is so small and it's very fine. It has been shown that the vaccine shots in patients on full dose warfarin also do not have the increased risk of bleeding at the injection site. So you're perfectly fine to continue your medication. Those who are worried, you can see that, you know, our ex-Prime Minister, he was 96. He has multiple medical conditions, including a heart bypass. 
he was fine with the vaccine. And then more things has come out on our um, social media saying that, you know, so many elderly people are taking the vaccines and they are doing fine. The only thing that you need to think about, people tend to ask, uh, are they going to evaluate us before that? Only these people will be evaluated. Those with, who are immunocompromised, those who actually have a severe allergic reactions or those with bleeding disorders. If you have a bleeding disorder, there are no contraindications to be vaccinated actually. It's just that we want to know what bleeding disorders that we are dealing with. For example, if you have hemophilia, we will give you things to stop the bleeding prior to that. So possible side effects that you can receive from the vaccines, not everybody will get side effects. The usual mild side effects would be, actually these are not even side effects, these are immune reactions that you tend to get. Uh, you'll get a day's worth of muscle ache, some fatigue, and even fever. But good thing is, that means your immune system is working and they tend to resolve in a day or two. The severe side effects that we're worried about would be your anaphylaxis or severe allergies. In fact, on our MySejahtera app, there's actually a section on the vaccination page where you can report the side effects that you're experiencing. You know, um, so this type of information is useful so that our Ministry of Health are aware of the type of symptoms that you're experiencing. But if the side effects or symptoms do not go away after three to four days, do seek medical attention then. But how come some people don't get it and I get it? Well, side effect gets all the attention. But if you look at the data from the vaccine clinical trials and the real world, you'll see that many people don't experience any side effects beyond a sore arm. In the Pfizer clinical trials, uh, one, of the, one out of four patients reported no side effects or lack of side effects. But the thing is, if you do not have any side effects, it does not mean that the vaccine isn't working. So at the bottom line is, you need to understand. We know that younger people mount stronger immune responses than old people whose immune system are way weaker as they you know, advance with age. Women typically have stronger immune responses than men. And, but then again, these differences don't mean that you are not protected and if you don't feel much after getting the shot. So the bottom line is even though an individual immune responses can vary, the data collected so far show that all vaccines approved are effective against severe COVID. The thing about AstraZeneca that you need to keep in mind is if you have severe or unpleasant headaches that gets worse after taking painkillers, severe headaches when you're lying down or on movement, unusual headaches presenting with blurry of vision, vomiting, difficulty of reading, these are the things that you might need to seek medical attention immediately. With regards to pregnant or lactating mothers, this is the latest advisory that we have in our country. Those pregnant within 14 to 33 weeks will only be given um, the Pfizer vaccine for now. But for lactating mothers, we are giving the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, with regards to the AstraZeneca vaccine for pregnant mothers, our ministry has mentioned that they will come out with an you know, update by the end of this week as they look through the data. New feature for My Sejahtera pregnant ladies will also be launched in our My Sejahtera app because this will enable pregnant and breastfeeding mothers to register for COVID-19 vaccination a lot easier. But let's say you are planning to get pregnant. If you're trying to become pregnant or want to be pregnant in the future, you may as well receive the COVID-19 vaccine because there is currently no evidence that any vaccine, including our current COVID-19 vaccines, could cause fertility problems. All of those were in fact just myths. If you're trying to become pregnant, you do not even need to avoid pregnancy after receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. Like all vaccines, scientists are still studying the COVID-19 vaccine carefully for side effects and will report as soon as something comes available. Regular blood donors are advised to delay their next visit to the blood bank after receiving their vaccination. If you do not have any side effects, you can give it seven a week after your vaccination. Or if you have a bit of fever or you know, muscle ache, try to give it a week after recovery of your symptoms. So you're taking a lot of regular medications for your health. Um, can you still take the vaccine? In fact, do note that the COVID-19 vaccines do not interfere with drugs that are taken to control blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, lung disease, or in fact, any other chronic health conditions. COVID-19 vaccines only 
affect the immune system, which has no impact to the effectiveness of medications to manage chronic conditions. So there is no influence or interaction between antibiotics as well with the COVID-19 vaccine. So when indicated, antibiotics may be taken at any time relative to your vaccine administration. How about painkillers? A lot of people want to take painkillers because they want to prevent symptoms. So, but what is advice is do not take them before a shot to prevent symptoms. But it's perfectly fine if you want to take them afterwards if needed. The concern about painkillers is that they might curb the immune system response that the vaccine aims to spur. Some research actually suggests that certain painkillers might diminish the immune system response. But truth is, this research was done pre-COVID-19 vaccine. To children who were given paracetamol or ibuprofen by their parents prior to the shadow vaccination. Honestly, I do not think there's a problem with taking Panadol after your vaccine injection, as long as you do not exceed the recommended dosage. I would recommend to wait until you experience side effects of fever or pain first before taking them and not to take them as prophylaxis beforehand to prevent the symptoms. If you want to register the program, you can either go to the app, the website, or the hotline number. Good thing is, are, are, you, know, you can actually register your parents who are not living with you, even though they're living in a different state. Because most of our elderly parents or relatives, they do not have smartphones or internet access. So what we can do for them despite being away is we can actually register them for the vaccination. The thing is, will the government help me with my medical bills if I get severe side effects? Okay, if you develop disabilities from severe side effects, there is a COVID-19 vaccine injury fund where we aim to provide financial aid to the affected people. All right, it is a very reliable concern because you know, not just for COVID vaccine, but in fact of any vaccination program, okay? Very rare and serious side effects do occur. The possibility is there. But some actually asked me, for example, they got their vaccination in um, Sunway. Could they, you know, should they come to Sunway Medical Center? Yes, you could come to Sunway Medical Center. But what we suggest actually is if you develop a nephrolexis or anything like that, go to the nearest hospital at your place. A government hospital is still better. The you know, if you're actually admitted for anaphylaxis, it will be covered by the government. But if you come to a private hospital, you might still need to pay depending on your insurance claim and so on. So the take home message is this, like many doctors on the front line of the pandemic, we get a lot of patients asking which vaccine I think is best. My answer would be the best vaccine would be the first one that you can get. It might take a little convincing, but I can assure you that all the vaccines we have here are excellent and they're all about the same. So when it comes to vaccines, they all protect us really well. So if you are holding out for something that you think might be a better vaccine, you might be refusing a vaccine that keeps you off the ventilator and ICU. So if you're lucky enough to be offered a vaccine or get into the program, the sooner we can all do it, the sooner we can get out of this pandemic together. This is not the time to wait and see anymore. There are hundreds and millions of data proving that the vaccines work and they are safe and they are effective. Waiting is not going to help anymore because when all of this is over, don't forget it's vaccinations that got us out of this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Erlini. That was actually a very, very informative presentation. Um, we do have quite a, a few questions. Okay, so we do have a few questions. A couple of people have actually asked this. Um, it's one from Sharath and John. Um, do you foresee the need to take vaccine update shots one to two years after taking the initial shot now? And if so, are we limited to having to take the same brand of vaccine subsequently? Okay. So, Actually, this is a good question, right? Um, a lot of people were asking whether we need booster shots after this. Thing is, everything is still under study. We do not know how long this immunity from the vaccination is going to last. Some have said that it might go up to two years. Some say that uh, despite being two years, after a year, the immunity might go down. So you might need to have booster shots, for example, like our influenza vaccine that we've been taking on a yearly basis or the meningococcal vaccine. So thing is, um, the likelihood of a booster or a third shot might be there but we don't know when or how long it's going to be. 
with regards to whether using the same brand, this, according to a lot of studies, have said that we might be able to change the brands because there's a thing where we, we are currently doing studies where we are trying to mix the vaccines up together. We have the CONCAF study by Oxford in the UK where they are mixing AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Novavax. They are trying to make a cocktail by looking at, you know, if they mix them up, would this cocktail be more effective for people? Would it last longer? So with regards to mixing the brands after this, um, yes, we might, we might be able to choose a different brand because according to our government, if a booster shot is required, the possibility of making it like a normal vaccination program where you can actually go to a private center, buy the vaccine that you want and get shot there, the possibility is there. But whatever it is, we still do not know and we still have to wait for whatever studies have shown, WHO is going to tell us or what KK and our Ministry of Health is going to recommend for us. Thank you, doctor. Um, so, okay, I have another one from Rachel. Um, for those elderly who are currently under medication for high blood pressure and high cholesterol, do we suggest them to seek for doctor advice before vaccination? I think you covered some of this earlier. All right, but it's a good question. There are a lot of people are quite worried about it. With regards to um, hypertension and high cholesterol, most of them, we actually do not need any doctor advice. The ones that we actually ask you to go, you know, ask your doctor first, ask your own treating doctor first, uh, the ones who are on chronic, med, you know, dialysis patients, those with bleeding disorders and stuff, because we want to know if that particular vaccine is okay for you or not. We currently have three different vaccines. Um, they have different ingredients. They project in a different way. And though they do not actually affect the medications that you are on, we actually want your treating doctor to have a look and recommend which one is better for you. But if you're on a regular hypertension, just um, a bit of diabetes and high cholesterol, these are normal medical conditions that mostly everyone has. You actually do not need to have a cons you don't you don't need to consult your doctor first before taking it. It's quite safe. And even at our vaccination center, there are counseling stations as well where you can actually ask them on that day itself whether it is, you are suitable to take that particular vaccine or not. So I think it's relatively safe for you to go ahead with it. Thank you, doctor. Um, here's another a couple of questions from Dr. Patricia. Um, and I believe you've covered this with the first one, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, okay. Have there been any clinical trials or studies that look at the AstraZeneca shot one and Sinovac shot two so far? That's the first one. The second one is what are the studies so far that examined a combination of vaccines? For clinical trial studies that look at AstraZeneca shot one, Actually, they made a lot of clinical trials, you know, uh, mostly on AstraZeneca rather than Sinovac itself. So I think we mentioned already earlier uh, about the AstraZeneca. One shot, you're going to get about 76% effectiveness. And then we already showed the public health of England data that came out that it actually works very well. For Sinovac, I personally do not actually have the exact study for it. But... Um, They've mentioned that the Sinovac study in the UK were actually pretty effective. Oh, sorry, in Turkey, sorry, where the effectiveness has increased to 76% after two doses. But with the mixing of the studies, one that I know, mixing brands, one that I know is the CONCAF in the, uh, and that's the one in by Oxford University. And there's another study by, from AstraZeneca where they're trying to mix AstraZeneca and Sputnik as well but results from the trials are still not out yet. So we're still not sure what is the outcome of it. But mixing brands of vaccines, these are not something new. It has been going on for ages. For example, our polio vaccines previously, you know, when they first the polio vaccine first came out, they had an effectiveness of only 50%. Then they started mixing the brands of polio vaccine. And they have now we have polio vaccines with three shots at 99% effectivity. So as you can see, data for the mixing vaccines, I'm sorry, Patricia, we do not have the exact numbers yet. But once it comes out, I'm pretty sure it will be made available to everyone across the world. Thank you, doctor. 
Um, this is one about pregnant women. There's a couple of questions. I'm going to combine them because you have covered that part. But um, Rebecca is asking, will the vaccine causes any trouble to get pregnant in the future? I know you've already covered that. But um, there's also another person, Elia, who's asked, may I know why it is not advisable for pregnant women um, more than 40, uh, 33 weeks to take the vaccine? The reason is um, from our MRCOG, sorry, the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the, rec the recommendation was only given at 14 to 33 weeks. Reason being is they did not do the trials on those more than 33 weeks. So they have very limited data on that. So that's why they don't actually recommend it. They are quite very near to giving birth already at that point. And also after 33 weeks, at 34 weeks, if anything happens, um, it's quite easy to prematurely or I say, take the baby out, deliver the baby at that point by cesarean section. That is mainly okay. the reason why they only chose up to 33 weeks. Okay, that's great. Thank you, doctor. Um, there's a question here from Eugene. Um, someone with autoimmune problems is not suitable to take the vaccine. Am I correct? Um, there was actually a study in the UK where they tested on people with autoimmune one autoimmune, the second thing is um, immunosuppressed. Thing is, it, they still give it to them. Side effects were very similar to those who do not have any problem. And what they realized is they might have a slightly less efficacy than those with no conditions in comparison to them, but it still works. There is no contraindication to not give it to those who are having autoimmune problems, for example, SLE and so on. So if you want to ask whether you, you can take it or not, yes, you can. But these are the type of people who I would recommend to actually consult your treating doctor first before taking the vaccine. Thank you, doctor. Um, there's a question here from Daniel. Um, do you have any initial information on the vaccine record being linked to a travel passport to allow us to travel internationally freely again? Okay, this travel passport is actually quite a famous question because I think a lot of us wants to be traveling again, right? Europe has already opened their doors for, you know, with the passport travel, but we haven't. Mainly because um, most of the countries won't really accept Malaysians due to our high surge of cases currently. The thing is, um, we have had a lot of things. Um, Initially, when the travel passport was open, Europe was only opening it for Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, and now they're opening for AstraZeneca as well. And for those who actually wanted to perform their Hajj or Umrah, only Pfizer and Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines are accepted, not Sinovac. And then we have issues where China would only accept people who had taken the Sinovac or China brand vaccines only. So a lot of these travel passports that we're having, um, it has become quite an issue internationally because people are looking at the brands who are allowed at different countries. This has not been resolved yet as far. Okay, We do not, for Malaysia, our travel passport, we are not starting it yet or anytime soon. Or the only ones who are allowed to go out of the country are the ones who have, they really have a reason for it. So with regards to our Malaysia and travel passport, no, there is no news yet. Uh, I tried asking this before to um, you know, the authorities for it. They could not even give me an answer on when it will be made available to our country. But with other countries, it's already open. So unfortunately, I cannot answer much about the travel passport so far as of now. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, I think this one's a similar to what you had before about mixing vaccines. It's from Lavinia. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it true that when you mix two vaccine shots, it will be more effective? For example, the first shot will be the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the second shot will be a Pfizer vaccine. If we are given the opportunity to mix the shots, would you recommend it? Well, for now, the studies for the mixing is still ongoing. We do not have the data for it yet. Uh, but we do mix the vaccine brands on cases where they get anaphylaxis or you no know, severe allergic reactions to the first shot. For example, I had uh, allergic reaction to Pfizer and 
I might be counseled to take AstraZeneca or Sinovac because of the different ingredients in it. But with regards to whether it is more effective, like I mentioned earlier to just now to Dr. Patricia, it is still ongoing. So we do not know which mixed brand of vaccine will be better. Uh, we will need to wait for the answers for that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I have one question here from Vignesh. Um, it says, uh, he says, hi, Dr. Eleni, thanks for the informative session. Can the vaccine affect the C-reactive protein reading in blood test? Hi, Vignesh. Okay, good news. No, it doesn't affect the C-reactive protein. The C-reactive protein means that an, an infection is going on. So for vaccine, causing your CRP to be raised, so far, thank goodness, the answer is no. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a good answer. Um, I think we only have time for one final question. We have, we have actually a lot of questions. Um, this is from Murali. If someone is C19 positive, can you still take the vaccine right after your quarantine? Uh, how long do you have to take? How long do you have to wait to get yourself vaccinated? Hi, Murali. Okay. Um, so what we're practicing right now in Malaysia is that we will give you the vaccine after six months of your recovery. Reason being is once you've recovered, you would have your natural immunity towards COVID-19. The reason we choose six months is because studies have shown that by six months, half of your immunity would have been gone. So that is when we'll start uh, vaccinating you six months onwards. But for frontliners, we take it a bit further, we'll let you be vaccinated at three months after your recovery. So that is the only difference. Thank okay. you, doctor. That's great. Um, I think that's all the time we have, um, unfortunately, for all the questions. Um, um, thank you, Dr. Laney, for a very insightful session, uh, for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. Um, it, it's definitely brought in our understanding of the vaccines and persuaded us that while side effects are temporary, health as well. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. If we haven't got to your questions, we will follow up with you after the event. Um, we hope you'll join us for our upcoming webinar. The topic is Penang, a key pillar to Malaysia's trade. This event will be on the 3rd of June from 4 to 5 p.m. And registration information will be on our website, www.bmcc.org.my. Um, it's complimentary to attend for BMCC members. And we also encourage you to sign up for our weekly newsletter to keep up with updates and news from the Chamber. Once again, thank you for attending. Take care, stay safe, and have a great weekend.